This is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. We are recording this conversation in the library over summer break with our good friend, Amir Farhang. Now, Amir um, was last on this podcast. If you're a longtime listener, you will remember his conversation. Um, it's chances are, a lot of you that are listening to this, uh, we're in middle school when we were last on this. <laughs> he just closed his eyes like, holy crap. Nine and a half years ago, Amir and I talked. Amir was then at... Uh, 180 in Los Angeles. He's still in Los Angeles, but he has segued his career into, I would say, a robust directorship. He is now a director, writer, and documentarian. And I'm going to read a um, little bio. I know that sometimes these intros can get long. Stick with me because I just want you to know who we're talking to today. This is a Creative Circus alumnus who um, has a sense of creativity and storytelling that I think stands above a lot of the work that we all consume, and a lot of the work that comes out of students that graduate from the school. There's a humanity, humility, charm, um, and entertaining quality to his work that has kind of stuck with Amir's work throughout his entire career. That was not in his LinkedIn. That was not on his website. That was me talking. The next part, I'm going to read directly from his website. Huge sports fan. In 2013, Amir directed the Adidas-produced basketball documentary, The Return, that followed the comeback of Chicago Bulls NBA MVP Derrick Rose. In 2014, he wrote and directed the successful Swingman campaign for the NBA and Adidas, which featured Damian Lillard and Andrew Wiggins. In 2015, he shot Sweat with the Best for Gatorade, working with sports superstars Dwayne Wade, Peyton Manning, Serena Williams, Jimmy Johnson, and Bryce Harper. Other clients he shot for include Holiday Inn Express, Priceline, UNICEF Tap Project, the NBA, Comcast, Snickers, and Best Buy. His World's Toughest Job Campaign for American Greetings, which, by the way, you guys need to see this. If you haven't already seen The World's Toughest Job, go to the podcast Facebook page, facebook.com slash DGMS podcast, or amirfaring.com, and check that out. It's absolutely remarkable. It garnered close to 30 million views and received a gold pencil from the one show, the Grand Effie at the 2015 Effie Awards, a pencil at DNAD, and a silver lion at Cannes. In 2016, Amir wrote and directed the Chevy-produced documentary web series Looking Up that explores the global phenomenon of cell phone addiction and how human beings are adapting to living in a hyper-connected world. Most recently, his work on IKEA, called Meet the Stars of the IKEA Catalog, took top honors for best casting for an international commercial. He lives in Venice, California. He's a director at Hungry Man, and he is back visiting the school because he, uh, I think, I'm just going to put words in it, I think he loves this place, and I think it's he enjoys coming back to visit. He was here last week for graduation, and welcome back again to uh, your old uh, stomping grounds. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm always always been very fond of this place. Why? The scene of the crime. Uh, <laughs> well, it represents a time in my life where I really took a huge risk uh, in pursuing my creative passion. And I come from a place where there weren't examples of success that I could look to and follow where I could achieve something taking this road. Uh, what were you doing before? Well, I was, I had was, you know, working for my dad bartending prior to that. I was uh, in Los Angeles when I left college uh, through a friend found my way in the actually the advertising business working at shy at day answering phones and and kind of nosed my way around there and worked started working in editing in the in the dub room there at mm. Venice Beach editorial uh, I f wanted to be a copywriter I didn't even know what a copywriter was like I said I didn't have any examples of of that you could make money doing this I thought all the brands made their own ads and right. uh, yeah. I found out there were advertising agencies and this ad, ad agency in Los Angeles at the time was doing some of the most famous work uh, of the era, Taco Bell Dog, Apple Think Different, PlayStation, uh, all those things that were just, at the time, they were the uh, the juggernaut. Yeah. I guess, I don't know who the juggernaut is right now. I guess you could say Droga, you could say a few other places, but this was the, this these were the, they were sweeping the award shows at the time, and I was 
I was sitting there answering phones. I was getting, I was answering phones. Steve Jobs was calling the switchboard and I was patching him through to Lee Clow. <laughs> um, I just can say, I can say proudly that I've spoken on the phone with Steve Jobs. That's pretty so cool. I thought I could become a um, short conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very <laughs> short. I actually have a funny story about that, but uh, uh, I, I actually can, um, uh, I, I thought I could get a job copywriting by just being funny in the office and um, and smoking weed outside. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It didn't hurt. Some guys have gotten jobs being funny in the office right. and writing funny emails and doing stuff. And everyone kept telling me about portfolio schools and you have to do this. And a lot of the great creatives had come out of Portfolio Center and Creative Circus at the time. Mm-hmm. So when you came to the circus, it was still young, right? I mean, circus was, I think, only six years old. Yeah, it was still sort of, yeah, it still had been born out of Portfolio Center, maybe Mm -hmm. seven years prior. um, I I left Shyatt. I was bouncing around L.A. writing. I actually had a short-lived stint writing for Shaquille O'Neal. And his website, Mm -hmm. uh, he was trying to start a brand that went deep, went uh, bottoms up. And uh, what was it about? It was, he was trying to start an on, at the time, at the time, it was 25 years ahead of – the thinking was 25 years in the future because the idea that that was hatched essentially relied on something that didn't exist and it would have needed social media. Oh, wow. He was trying to create daily content that he would upload and create this lifestyle brand where you would follow – see what it was like to like follow the life of a professional athlete and superstar – the problem was is that he would dump – he would come back every like two weeks with a little bit of footage that he shot – and we couldn't upload it and no one would watch it. And it was all, it was never relevant. Yeah. And he was trying to create a brand that you could customize your own shoe and all this stuff. And the technology behind the shoe wasn't great. They couldn't really get that worked out. The shoe didn't look that great. It's hard for a seven foot one, uh, 360 pound guy to sell shoes is, is relatable <laughs> as much as people liked Shaq. He, the guys who sell shoes generally are smaller, and that's a whole different conversation. But um, he, uh, the guys who sell shoes are typically smaller. They're typically like you know most basket. Most, you you want to be able to put your feet, be able to put yourself in the other man's shoes. Right, when right. the man is one of maybe six people on this earth, right, walking with, literally and carrying those dimensions as a giant, you can't really relate. You can't really relate. Right. So uh, you know he did sell shoes, but you know we just the business was sort of. At the time, was uh, was riding the dot com boom, and they got some investors, and it just didn't work out. And I was sort of left without a job, without a home, all those things. I went home. I was working for my dad, and I had this crossroads. Uh, the circus means a lot to me because I see every. I kept taking that advice from creatives that were working at Shy, like go back to school. Here's the school to go to, and I was at this crossroads where I was going to either work for my dad and carry on the tradition of running a bar. And or I was going to go to the creative circus and just go to bars and then just and, go to and, maybe and just, just go to bars right. and like joke around about stuff. Bar would still be part of things, but I, uh, you know, and I didn't have help. Uh, it was very much made clear to me that I would be paying for it myself wow. and all those things. So I took the loan out. I drove my car from Tucson all the way to Atlanta. Started working in a restaurant. That's and bold, man. That's and I, bold. and it just means a lot to me, you know, because I, 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 I doubled down on on. I just knew that I could have taken an easier route. Were you good? At were you good when you got here? Did you feel like you made the right choice? Right uh, away? Did you feel I, like you were doing that? You did well. Like the, I feel like, like I did well. I mean, I I got here and I remember being overwhelmed when I walked through the doors and seeing all the work on the the walls and 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 meeting and I realized, oh wow, this. I also felt like I had come home in a lot of ways because this is a little bit of the island of misfit toys. If you end up here, there's chances are that you either didn't follow a path that was laid out before you or you just didn't know what you wanted to do. And a lot of people had a similar point of view on the world that I did. It's interesting you say that because I've, I've always felt that way about the school. And that was my – my experience was very different but similar in the sense that I felt like I found my place here that I had never had in high school or college or even after college. Um, and I, I wrote a brief for a copywriter's class to write a tagline for the school based on that insight – and this writer named Jeremiah Follett wrote a tagline that said, the creative circus where weird kids become employable. That's great. And I loved it. I thought it was right on point. And there is a contingent of 25 to 30% of the students, my wife being one of them when I met her, who's like, I'm not weird. Like, I knew I wanted to do this. She'd had graduated from college with an advertising degree, worked at Leo Burnett right. for an internship, came to school with a briefcase to get this job done. And uh, it's, 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 
I think it resonates with a lot of us, but I don't think it resonates with everybody. Well, I mean, I, you tell me someone who shows up anywhere with a briefcase. Well, I'm like, well, that person's weird. <laughs> where weird kids, where weird kids become employable. She doesn't. She hates the name of the school. She didn't like the tagline because uh, this is a professional decision, and I think that it. it I think it alienated. It. You know, it's funny because Norm would say it's not alienating people. It's filtering out the people that might not fit in this culture that may be better suited in a more traditional environment. It's not a tradition. It's not a traditional educational environment. So, um, what do you think you learned, or what was your takeaway from school? If you can put yourself back in that head, I know this was 16 years ago. But if you can put yourself back in the head of um, having graduated, what do you feel like you got from the experience of being here other than connections and a network and a job or whatever? Uh, I think I just learned the the discipline and the uh, it gave me a place to focus on the craft. And I learned I learned exactly what it took to get to that good idea. Um, and and what is it time, time, uh, time, perseverance, mm-hmm. uh fortitude uh uh impatience quantity quantity the i guess the but also you're, but you're impatient well the impatience of not settling mm. the you know not saying okay well i want to be impatient you can you can be impatient by just wanting to get the job done and being finished and wanting to go on and do whatever it is you want to do uh that day or that night with your friends or you can be impatient with. I have not settled. I have not arrived at something that I think is good. Um, you know, I, I think I learned presentation skills, having to stand mm. above in front of a bunch of uh, my peers. When I said like I feel like I had arrived home, I mean I, I remember being here and like sitting in the the little cafeteria. I don't know if it's a cafeteria. You could call it a cafeteria, mm-hmm. but like the little lounge area, and like you just you're hearing groups of people. Who have, who have obviously been here for a few quarters and developed relationships and de- developed rapport, you're hearing them talk and they're making jokes and they're clipping and they're saying things that are so fast and you realize like these are, those are the jokes I would make. Those are the mm-hmm. kinds of friends I, those are the kinds of people that I've always wondered if they've even existed and um, they're not so serious. Everything's, everything is not taking, taken so seriously and so you realize like, oh, okay, like I belong a little bit. I, there's a place that has validated my quirky, you know, pl- a place where weird people come employable, like you said. But like it is a place where people, I think, I think everybody is searching for acceptance. Everyone is searching for that place where they feel like those are my people. That's my tribe, yeah. right? There's a sense of tribe and a sense of community I think we're always looking for. And I feel like this was a place where I knew that the things I said, the, the points of view I had would be met with contention and we, they would be challenged but it would be okay to think that way it would be okay to be to think outside the box a little bit and mm. to have that uh that's the, that those sort of rose-colored glasses i guess it's the only way to really think about yeah, that's it. really cool yeah. so you mentioned that you had before that time you'd worked maybe in editing places is there was there always a sense of you as a creative that you although you're a writer who can write, were you always thinking in, in, in terms of picture and video and, and, and television? Is that, was that sort of the strength that you, or not strength, but your sort of what pulled you? Well, you pull to that? when I worked in the dub room at Shiat, uh, you know, my job back then, everything was done, uh, on three quarter inch tape yeah, and, yeah. uh, all the reels were, so everything was in, there was a catalog of like, it's not like, not, not unlike this room. Imagine all these books in here. There's thousands of books in here, by the way, if, for those who were listening. But like, imagine all these books were three quarter inch tapes, and one. And I would sit in this room with two screens, and someone would come in from the account team on uh, Nissan, and they would say, um, "Hey, really quick, we need uh, we need every car commercial Michael Bay has ever shot oh, um, on a half inch tape, and we need it by noon." And so I'd go to uh, the Michael Bay's, uh, real, and, and I take it off and I search in this on YouTube. You know, right. So no, no. So that. I would take that, I would watch them all down and I would t- put a half inch of a, a blank half inch tape. All right. So uh, let me explain something it. to the, to yeah. the listeners. So half inch tape is a, three, a VHS. Right. Exactly. Half right. inch tape is a VHS and three quarter inch is like a jumbo VHS. It's like, it's like the size of a big book. Yes. And, and it basically allowed for the quality to be better right. than, than a half inch Because there's tape. more tape. So there's like more information. There's on more the tape, more information. And so, and what also that didn't allow that digitally uh, you can do now is like you could just go and now they now at like Hungry Man when they want they want my reel and they go, can you just put all Amir's sports work on a reel? He can just drag and drop everything right. onto a link. Yeah. And that but what did it forced me to do? And I now I was I was go. doing that 14 hours a day. 
So that was like for every account, for every new business pitch, oh, Shiat wants an archived reel of every comedy spot they've done. I mean, we need all of our our PlayStation work mm-hmm. and all of our Nissan work sent here. We need just the Apple stuff here. We need all. Was, oh, it, was it well organized in there? It was well organized and and. Uh, so, but it also required that I watched every single one of them because mm-hmm. I had to make sure that the, that if I didn't, if there was a bl- a glitch or anything, and I also had to quality check every tape. So right. you would dub it and then you'd have to watch it again to make sure it was checked. Do you it, like this? What? Do you enjoy it? Did I enjoyed it. Yeah. I enjoyed it because I got to watch all these commercials yeah, cool. and I, and some of them were great and so good. And I was so turned on by the idea of like, they I just that Nissan spot where the guy shopping with his son turns a corner and the cars in a big box. Like it's a toy. Yes, exactly. That, God, that spot was you so... know, uh, it was shot by Spike Jones. It's so good. I can tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Spike, Spike Jones. Um, and he also shot in that same campaign. He shot the one where the, where, uh, the dog is bored and he pushes his lazy boy uh, down the hill, out, mm-hmm. out the door while they, the, his owner is napping on it, and it goes all the way downhill, and he almost dies like seven times. It's set to the Charlie Brown theme oh, song, yeah. and at the very yeah. end, he wakes up and he's in front of a Nissan truck. And yeah. the guy was actually another Spike Jones commercial. Uh, the guy he cast was Mark Gonzalez, the skateboarder. Oh god, no one even knew that. Wow, and he couldn't act, and all the creatives lost their minds because like they were like, this guy can't do the can't give us the range we're looking for and he ended up he ended up pulling it off that's one of my tiny peeves is when they have athletes host saturday night live because they're not funny peyton manning was funny he's actually one of the guys who can actually act okay um but yeah I, for the most part yes they're not doing it for um but i wanted to be a, i was like how do you become a? so i asked the question back then how do you become a director and dan mm. <laughs> the guy the guy who ran venice speech editorial he said do you have a trust fund oh god and i said no and he goes Oh shit! Well, you either got to figure out how to shoot stuff on your own, but a lot of these guys, the names that you are looking at, have most people who are aware of the director business have are coming from that that line of work. Their right. parents have done something in the mm-hmm. business, or they've grown up with some means. Was it what was the question? Was it because that you're not going to make money for a while? That's right. It was right. It, that was that was another thing. Was right. like do you, he was joking, but it was like you either got to figure out a way to make some money, um, or if you don't have some money. Uh, you know, it's it's not going to be easy, is what he was saying. So was this, and so I was like, "Well, there's no way I'm going to do it." And I didn't want to be an editor because he was miserable, right? Um, it's a tough one. And other other guys, actually, Dan wasn't so miserable. He's a good guy, but like, and he really was very talented at his job. But there were other people that I noticed editing that were just kind of not into it. They mm-hmm. were kind of hated that they were in these dark rooms and that, um, or may, that might just be the plight of the editor in general. There might be just a d- disposition they have. But I didn't want to sit in the room. And you don't edit. want somebody standing behind you telling you what. I mean, not and especially not me. I no, mean, not, I mean, there's not, a, well, there's a lot of you. I mean, yeah. people. With, you is just someone with vision who knows what they want, and that's not a fun. Yeah, it's it. I mean, these days especially, like with what what I've observed and as, as a director and seeing how how many versions you have to shoot and how many different takes you have to get and how you have to appease so many people and that the client wants one thing that. The creatives want one thing, the agency wants one thing, and then you want one thing. And you you could either say, I'm only doing it this way and more than likely not get the job. Or you could try to get everything and then you, you really subject the editor to um, 73 takes, uh, 73 versions of a, of a 30 second right. spot. And right. and so really that, just, and so, I mean, that's, that's, that, that is a, it's become more of a trade and there is some art to it. There's absolutely art to it. And when, uh, um, you know, it's but it becomes daunting. I mean, I've it, it can wear on the creative, and you can you can see it wearing on the editor. It wasn't like that back then as much as it is now. But you know, I just I just saw what I wanted to do. I didn't I didn't, and I'd actually thrown away that dream of being a director when I heard about what it really took, and it would just seem so crazy. I don't even know how to write an ad. How am I going to write? Uh, right. How am I going to direct a commercial? But um, I think that those you know when they talk about the ten thousand hours. Right. I, I think I got the 10,000 hours here, but I think I also got a lot of hours just in that dub room watching commercials. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really cool. So when you came here and you graduated as a copywriter, you're, that's your career. You weren't yeah. sort of still saying like, oh, this is going to be the step no, I take to no, become no. a director. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to be a copywriter. I just wanted my name in CA. Yeah, that's great. That was the goal. That's what was the goal. CA, my name yeah. in CA next to a print. How long did that take? Uh, it took four and a half years yeah. to get something and to, to you, win any awards. But you had ideas that were CA worthy the first year. They just didn't see the light of day. 
Do you think that you were good? None of them saw the light of day. Nothing. <laughs> half, half. No. I mean, every, where did you start? I started at BBH. Okay. Uh, Bartle Bogle great, Hagerty. Great print agency. They were a great print agency. They were a great TV agency. Mm-hmm. They were actually, some of those, I didn't realize I was watching them in the dub room. Some of the great Levi's ads of the 90s mm-hmm. um, that broke directors like Jonathan Glazer and Michelle Gondry. A lot of those ads um, were cinematic and they were events. They were two minute films that were just artful masterpieces. And I just didn't know commercials could look like that. Mm. And uh, I got to work for the agency that created that mm-hmm. for the man who John Hagerty, who was the creative director who pushed that vision. And um, there was real attention to craft and you had to write your, you know, you just knew that you were writing against a legacy there. And, but I also didn't sell a lot of work because I had a propensity to think in in a longer form sometimes and i think it really excited my creative directors but a lot of the work client client was client things that clients weren't asking for that's interesting you know like that's and so that's why the the first thing i ever really made that did really well that won a lot of awards was it was a tv show that was packaged into that was sort of it had a lot of components to it tv commercials were one of them but it was a one-hour tv show that was on mtv and um, it was, what was it called? It was called Game Killers for mm-hmm. Axe Body mm-hmm. Spray, and or it was actually the deodorant. And uh, it was a, um, you know, it was I think before there was no Titanium Lion, mm-hmm. there was no Integrated Lion, yeah, uh, there was no branded entertainment right. categories. They had to make that to to solve the problem that these things deserve awards. But what are they? What I, are I they? remember the conversations like how do we, what do we give this? I mean, how, there was no category for that kind of stuff when it was being made originally. Yeah, I mean, and there was a there actually was the Titanium. Uh, award but they um we didn't get it that year but they they didn't have a brand of, yeah they, they just didn't they there wasn't enough of the work out there okay yeah. to justify i mean it, we would have probably won because we would have been oh, five one of five entries right um that was the same year burger king did uh the xbox video game so like those were two things that were being held up as like these are the contenders for the titanium and neither one of us won and it went to this other um this, this thing called bar Japanese barcode. But how do they define the titanium? Is that integrated? The titanium is digital? like an idea that in reinvents. It's it's sort of something it that its own medium. It or something? sort of does something that we've never seen before, and, right. and uses a, an unconventional approach. Like and subservient chicken. I think that would certainly have could certainly have been a titanium worthy thing. Like at the time, no one no one had really done interactive like that mm-hmm. before, and. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, uh, I think so going back to the, um, going back to why, I guess, why I didn't win anything. It was, it's hard. First of all, it's hard. The, you don't, I wasn't it, asking you why you didn't win anything. Well, no, in school, well, in school, you also can green light your own ideas and go produce them. Of course. Right. So in, in and then in also like in most agencies, they don't, they don't advocate scam advertising. Some do, some don't. I, I worked for one that was very staunchly against it. So even if we had really cool, yeah, even if we had cool print campaigns that like we produced that we executed as really good comps and we went and presented them, <clears throat> if they got killed, they, they weren't getting like dead. submitted into a, a obscure publication once so right. that we could enter them. So right. it's just it gets a lot harder. It gets a lot harder. And by the way, what you're working off of in school is like you're being you're sort of playing against. You know what most people do. This is what I you you study you study the past a little bit. You study the the craft of advertising. You get into the award books. You learn. You copy until you develop your own style mm-hmm. and you try to do something original. But when you're doing that in school, a lot of the great ideas were executed. If you're, if you're looking at awards books, they've actually happened two years two ago. Two years ago, right? So what's happening when you get to an agency is you're living. You're actually fast forward into the present moment and. Everyone knows what's been done. In fact, you're talking to, you're presenting to people who did that work. Right. <laughs> and, yes. and, uh, which is daunting. And it just, the, the stakes get raised. And yeah. all of a sudden, like, you're not allowed, if you, if you don't crack it, you can't change the brand. You can't change the assignment. Mm. You can't just phone it in and, or crumple up your paper, throw it in the garbage and go, what's next? Right. Um, so sometimes you have to sell, you have to sell something. So, yeah. so I asked you what you took away from school. What'd you take away from the time at BBH? What do you think was sort of what resonated, stayed with you? Um, or was it a step to the next thing? It was a step to the next thing. I that? think I think working for John Hagerty was like you know he he had just an irreverence about him. Um, he had a way of inspiring you. Uh, it taught me the attention, like I was talking about the attention to working on 
writing Levi's scripts, which I probably wrote a hundred of them, didn't mm. sell one. Learning what it took to to, to write a, a crafted sixty second commercial that was visual and and had great storytelling. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about you know we when we did that TV show that was a almost a mini film school in a lot of ways mm. because my first shoot a lot of times your first shoot is a thirty is a is a uh, a thirty second commercial maybe a couple thirty second commercials you go to L A for three weeks and you're done you shoot you edit and you're done our our sh- we had you have and you maybe have three shoot days we had 30 shoot days to, to execute that so i was on set for 30 straight days you like that as a writer i loved it you know, i was Obviously. like i mean it was like i couldn't believe that was my job i couldn't believe like i got to do that and it was i took this at this i mean so i may not have shot i may have shot that one thing i may have done that one big thing in my four years at bbh but i didn't I mean, I got I got a whole film school when I got yes. 30, 30 shoot days out of right. it, and being on Huge. and and executing not only commercials but long form and working with radical media. And it's amazing how much you, you you realize you learn when you're working that you didn't even realize how much more there is to learn. Oh man, yeah. I mean, it's you you never. I think I said this to you the other day, and you mentioned it to the oh, students yeah. that is it, it was if I. I think the one thing that I I never consciously said, uh, okay, I'm going to use this this uh, portfolio in copywriting, and that's my education there. And now I'm going to go to to BBH, and I'm going to try to sell long form content, and I'm going to sell something, and I'm going to use that as my film school, and I'm going to push off of that, and I'm going to use all the all my experience, and, and I'm going to take that to my next agency. I'm going to sell some even more long form content. I'm going to work with directors that, that I'm going to use as mentors mm-hmm. um, at Crispin, um, Crispin in, in Miami and Boulder and at 180. And I'm going to work with mentors like Paul Hunter and Henry Alex Rubin. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit in their back pocket and I'm going to watch their, watch how they were. I didn't never thought no, of it that of way. Of course not. But if I could give any advice to students is like, is never stop considering yourself a student. Absolutely. Uh, never stop thinking of yourself as, um, Never stop even taking classes. I mean, I think if you get out of school, you know, one thing I wish I would have done early on is take, and I had to do it when I became a director. I had to learn, all right, well, how do, I was having a hard time, like, figuring out how to talk to actors in their own language. And I was like, well, I feel like I keep telling them, like, I want them a certain emotion out of them, or I want this and that. And they're just not quite understanding how I, I think they understand what I mean. And I don't want to parrot. I don't want to show them or throw the line to them and say, do it like this, because then, you're sort of taking away, you acting. Know, taking away the acting. Well, it'd be, it would be like me telling a cop, like if I was a creative director, it'd be like me telling a copywriter to write, to write to write a headline for for this, and but to write this headline. Yeah, exactly. And to write it like this, yeah. and rather than saying like, "What the hell could this kid come up with?" That I would that never. Parroting is a last resort. It's a la- It's like when there's nothing else is working. It's anymore. a last resort. So I, you know, I wish I would have taken an acting class earlier. Oh, that's interesting. And I you took it. Have you? I've taken improv. Yeah, I've taken some improv class and classes and um, I'm looking into taking another I'm actually signed up on have you seen that thing called master class that I have which so, one uh, Judd Apto does a comedy yeah. one I want to take that I want to take um, Helen Mirren she's just mm-hmm. doing an acting workshop I'm interested in some of that stuff and and as a director one thing that you do have is that uh, is maybe the biggest perk of the job is sometimes you have free time whether yeah. you yeah, like yeah. it or not right, exactly sometimes it's by choice if you're turning down jobs that you're just not interested in That's or cool. sometimes you're the it's slow like and uh yeah. and so you've got to figure out a malcolm ways. gladwell one looks amazing that one looks amazing absolutely yeah. yeah so okay so you dropped this thing at the beginning and the listeners are wondering if i'm going to go back to it i think this you said you have a story about talking to steve jobs on the phone <laughs> so <laughs> the way it worked on the switchboard you should have seen his face just now. the way it worked at, at shyatt on the switchboard was um uh, someone had to get, we had, we all took turns. There was always three of us at a certain, at, a, at, at, there's always three of us on the switchboard, but one, one person, every other, whatever you, you had every three days, one person had to be, I had to be there the first one there at 8am. Right, right. Um, and I had to turn the phones on every third day. I had to answer the phones. And so some days you get there and it'd be 8am. You'd be the only one. And the phone calls would start rolling in and no one's in the office. So one day I'm in there, it's 8 a.m. and the phone rings and he would always say, uh, Steve Jobs looking for the cloud, you know, and I guess Mr. Jobs right away. And you always are like, I mean, it was like, it's like, and I always say, what was it like when you heard Steve Jobs on the phone? And it was, he wasn't, by the way, he wasn't Steve Jobs 
who invented the iPod by that he or the iMac hadn't even come out yet. Right. So this was just think different, Steve. This is Steve right. Jobs who invented personal computing, right. and he hadn't done. He think different had hey, just come out. What year is this? This is in two thousand. Oh, sorry, nineteen ninety eight. Oh yeah, no, he just got back. He, he just, just got just back. back. He'd been yeah. back two years. Yeah, this is so, right before the I, iMac. So the iMac, you know, it was coming now. The iMac was coming. And they, I think they had maybe actually they had just launched the iMac. Yeah, in ninety eight it came out. Yeah, and uh, and so you know. It's not, it's not. It, it wasn't he, the cult of personality that it is now. And, but he was still a cult of personality. Right. You know, it was, it was, it was the cult of personality he for that time. He wasn't a historical figure. And it would, you know, no one knew what he was about to do. Right, right, And, right. and, but at the same time, it was still like when he called, it was still like that, that scene in Star Wars when Vader tells the guy, like, he's like, somebody says something about the emperor and he goes, well, you could tell him yourself when he, when he gets here later right. today. And he's like, what? Yeah. The emperor's coming here and yeah. he, and he just was like, he's yeah. all of a sudden his posture gets straight up yep. and, so whenever Steve, you hear Steve Jobs, you just would sit straight up. Right. And so he's like, Steve Jobs looking for Lee Clown. I'm like, right away, Mr. Jobs, uh, one moment. So I push him through. Phone goes straight to voicemail. Come back. I go, I'm going to, you know, uh, sorry, no one's picking up. Let me try one more time. Try again. Try his, try his assistant. Try the person in the office next door. No one's picking up. Mm-hmm. And uh, I come back to him and I'm like, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Jobs, but um, Lee doesn't seem to be available at the moment. Uh and uh, he's and then I looked down and 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 there was this like catwalk. If you ever go to Shia, um, there was this catwalk, and you can kind of see down into the main pit area where all the he he designed this amazing uh, in, in Playa Vista, this like amazing office, like looks like prison cells, but he painted in yellow. And mm-hmm. um, it, there's like a little old there's an old Nissan uh, truck in there with a surfboard. There's a basketball court, and it looks like creative Disneyland. So all of a sudden I see Lee, I see Lee Condry, you know, moving around, milling around with a couple other people and he's walking around and they're all talking and I'm like, uh, yes, uh, well actually I do see him. Um, and he's down there. He's down by his office. He's just not by the phone. He must not be able to hear it. And he goes, well, okay, well how, how long do you think it would take to go down and tell him that I'm on the phone? And I said, I don't know, like 45 seconds, a minute. And then there was this long, this pause, which maybe felt like an hour, but it was probably six <laughs> seconds. And I said, hello. And he goes, I'm counting. Oh, my <laughs> great. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, shit. Now right it's away, 30, sir. Now and I take the headset off and I sprint down. Now it's 38. I, Steve's on the phone. He's, Why didn't you tell me? I am doing that now. I'm telling you right now. Oh, He's my like, God. That's a, hilarious. Yeah. God. Um, I'll never get, I mean, honestly, that's like, I never, you don't even realize I was 23 years old, you know, I probably smoked a bowl of weed on the way to work. That right. morning. I mean, it's like, you know, I had no idea what was going on. Like, I would imagine the phone starts ringing early out on the West coast. Cause we've been up for, yeah, we've been at work for two hours at that. Point. Oh yeah. They used to get so mad. The first call would come in from the president of shy New York, Bob Cooperman, who would be so pissed that no one was answering the phone and right. you'd, you'd get his wrath. Ugh. Um, all right. So I want to talk about, um, about your segue to directing and I want to talk about collaborations with creatives and what you learned as a creative and how to work with directors. We mm. talked about that for a second in the hall on Friday. And um, first, I guess, let's talk about, I'll set this up, tee it up for you. Mm. So how did it start? How, where did you end up sort of moving away from when did you step so I started out of copywriting and creative direction to well, directing? Well, it started with, um, I started noticing that I was happiest when I was in production. I was happiest when we were, and especially since I had the benefit of doing some of these executions that were, that were longer. Um, I would, I just was enjoying my time, not because I wasn't in the office. What do you like about it? Is it everything? Is it, is it it crafting the story? Crafting the story, the casting, just the, 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 the little family that forms that gets created in each production, hmm. um, especially when you make something good and, and the, hmm. the fights that happen within it and the, the triumphs, the, the failures, all those little things. Casting, I, I'm fascinated with casting. Uh, it, it's, it, a lot of people find it boring and I understand I why. it's so important. Yeah, it's so, I mean, it, if you cast properly, then I actually say the trick to directing actors is to cast the right people. And if you take that process uh, seriously and and are discerning enough, then they're going to present you with the execution and the performance you want, mm-hmm. and um, and you don't you don't have to turn them into something. 
that they aren't. So and, interesting. I was watching that. I've done this on the podcast before. I apologize to listeners. I, I, I was watching a documentary last night with Jurgen Klopp. He's the manager of Liverpool Football Club. And they were trying to replace a center back and they took Virgil van Dyke. Virgil van Dyke's good. He may not be the best center back in the world. And they said, well, well how did you know? How did Jurgen know this was the guy? Because this was our man. I know this, this is our man. He's got the personality. He's got this great voice. We said, we don't have this character on our team. We need this. This is, the t- this is the type of person we need to make this team work the way that this team needs to work. We don't have that leadership. So he he did that. He ran this algorithm in his mind about what the what the group needs, and he, yeah. ca- he cast this person as the right guy f- to succeed. And it's it takes a, a genius mind to think that to be able to sit in a cast in a casting session and understand what your idea is enough to say who's going to bring that, who's going to plus one that a lot of times, right? It's not always like who's going to be the most faithful to the idea, but who's going to bring something new to that idea. So I just want to mention that. That, uh, yeah, wasn't a question. I, I never actually looked at uh, I, I, coaches. I think are looking to fill roles on teams, and sometimes the most talented player doesn't work within the construct of those four other guys. If we're talking about basketball, it's catalytic. You often, need you need someone that's going to complement mm-hmm. the cast and the other players. I mean, it's the same exact thing. Absolutely, yeah. yeah that's that's a great analogy. But he talked good. about his voice, like his literal voice. Yeah, like, like how he sounds on the field. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in that position, I think some there there's one of the more vocal of, of the players on the pitch. And I think you probably, I mean, I think his, there's a personality and maybe he, that's even super more dialed in than, than, uh, than I ever would have thought of well, though, to, center, think, to think about right. how people would respond to the way someone is shouting orders at them. Well, center back faces the, all the action, right? He's never, he's never in front of it. He's always behind it. So all right, so how did you segue? So you were always happiest on production, and then sort of how did that? Happen? I got an opportunity on a an Adidas shoot uh, with Paul Hunter, um, who's who's a uh, known for his music videos and 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 commercials, and he's done a movie and um, super. He's the founder and um, of Pretty Bird. Uh, he, I was you know I was given you know I wasn't always the easiest to work with. I was always pushing and I was nosy and I was like. We should try this. We should try that, and I didn't. Maybe it wasn't. Wait, wait, hold on. Had you heard that you were difficult to work with, or do you feel like you? Oh yeah, an, yeah, yeah, yeah. An for, asshole. Uh, sometimes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it was, it was about great. the work. It was, was about, it about the work. It, it was about the work, and I think I, I was, I could be petulant um, at times, and uh, and 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 force my way, and 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 throw my toys a little bit, but mm-hmm. it wasn't like. Uh, you know, I it definitely early in my career, mm-hmm. the etiquette. I think I, I was something I had to learn along the way. Uh, but Paul, you know, but the, the directors were really the guys that I worked with. I I think Paul saw saw something in me. He he was always encouraging of my point of view. He always wanted to know my point of view. And I think I was bothering him one day about something. And and um, there was a point where we had to in, do a piece. That was complimentary. It was a long form documentary thing for Adidas called Brotherhood. And, uh, you know, he just can't be in everywhere at once when you're shooting something like that. Right. And so we had a second unit and right. he sent me off with the second unit to go. And at one point I had to interview Dwight Howard and I was like, and I just, you know, he goes, he's like, he said, well, you, you know what you want. His way of, he, he looked me in the eye and he said, and I was like, well, I need to do this. And when he's like, well, you know what you want. I think you should just, you should get it. And then he walked away from me and I just like this, all this, I got hit with this like rush of adrenaline and I'm like, what do you mean I should get it? I should. So camera guys standing there and the sound guys holding it and they're like, and Dwight's looking at me, you know, this professional athlete who's like looking at me like, all right, am I just going to stand here? And next thing you know, I'm asking him questions and getting him to stand over here. You nervous? Oh, extremely, (laughs) extremely nervous. Uh, and so I realized, okay, well, it wasn't exactly like highbrow filmmaking what I did, but it, it gave me a taste of like, okay, I think maybe I can do this. And then the next Adidas campaign that we did uh, involved was a month long shoot, shooting uh, four films. What agency is this? This was at One Eighty in mm-hmm. L.A. and uh, with and I and Henry Alex Rubin was the director who had directed an Oscar nominated film called Murder Ball. Um, and I went on the road with Henry. My my partner was kind of back and forth a lot because he had just had a baby, so it was really just me and Henry mm-hmm. uh, traveling all over the United States. And I really saw under the hood of what it took to 
to make to, to film to be a filmmaker and he was like you should you know he, he was very encouraging as well i think a lot of directors always tell the creatives you should be a director because what are they going to say don't be a director mm-hmm. you know you'll never probably never work with them again and you, there's a certain side of things you just interesting and so i think you he but he and i really really connected and he was not a, sure that's true I'm, was, not, I'm not sure directors tell every creative they, they don't do. always but i mean <laughs> but you uh, just never know if they're joking or or if I, no, think, I, I think I think every see, it, no, no, no. I, I, my guess is that they saw in you uh, a, a point of view and an opinion and a vision, and they wanted you to become a director so that you could scratch that itch. Not every creative is that powerful with a vision. A lot of them see that that decision making to the director and to the edit and all that other stuff. Yeah, it's true. And I also thought, I also thought was I, it's a different it's a segue to a different conversation, but I. I also thought that when I was going to become a director, that I would work with with creatives that were like me. Mm, right, and and it's not often the case. No. You're actually a lot. A lot of the times, you don't. A lot of them aren't paying attention. A lot right. of them are just eating, and they're like they're traveling all over the world with you, and they're not even looking at the screen. Right. This is one thing I'm glad to hear you say that because this is what I tell our students here. It's like when you go on a set, it's going to happen really fast, and you need to close your eyes and listen, or you need to stare and watch because this is when your idea is being made, and you're going to get into edit, and you're not going to have it, and you're going to be upset, and it's your fault. And if you don't remember the moment you came up with that idea, when you're sitting on the set, you screwed yourself yeah. because you have to remember that feeling when you were sitting with your partner. Because now they're making it, and this is your moment. And it's crazy to me to think that you're not like keyed into that second. The problem is that second happens surrounded by hours of, of lighting and blocking and, and makeup. And it's, it's you can be watching paint dry, and yeah. it's easy to, and especially now because of how accessible you are by uh, with with your phone and your laptop, mm-hmm. and how fast distractible how fast the business the agency business is working now that. Sometimes they're being asked for things that they're working on during a shoot and they're they're sort of not focusing and uh, and it's hard and they put a lot of trust in you to deliver on everything and hopefully that's what you're doing. But, what, but sometimes what, they'll ask you, oh, did we get a take like this? And it's like, you were there, man. Right. You know, uh, you can't ask if we got a take like that. You're in the edit. Right. How, you know, exactly. and I, I mean, we didn't get that take. I'm sorry. I got 15 takes. Right. Um, and I got every other way you asked me. And now you're asking if there's one where he's a little bit more out of breath. No, we don't have that. Right. You can't put that into the computer. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's not that's not a command. That's on, not a that's not a function. It's not a key command. function. Twelve. Function exactly. Twelve. So what makes the best? Cl- so the best collaboration I hear you saying is someone who's, who's kind of locked in on the set has a point of view. Do you want a, a creative partnership with a maybe an agency team that has a point of view? Or I mean, absolutely. I w- yeah. A point of view. Uh, someone who is always asking questions, a challenging, little, a little petulant, a little petulant, challenging, uh, uh, not just accepting your choices uh, if they don't agree with them, not just it, it, voicing their opinion. If they don't agree with your choice on uh, if the background wallpaper should be purple, tell me why. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm open to hearing that. Tell me why and have a point of view on it. You can't tell me it's just because you don't like the color of purple or you don't like it mm-hmm. uh, because. I can tell you why I've chosen purple. Mm-hmm. I can say that the mother in this uh, shoot is from this part of the country, and she grew up this way. And purple's part. I, I, I'll, I'll, I will create that mm-hmm. that uh, necessity. I'll create that backstory. I'll create that subtext, mm-hmm. and I can offer that. And and but if you tell me, you know, it's just be, if you tell me that the rival brand is purple, then done. We'll, yeah. We're throwing it sure. away. Right. And I won't, I won't right. argue with you again. Right. So there's reasons. There's yeah. reasons that are also not art completely art are um, motivated by art. Mm-hmm. There's also you know reasons that are motivated by commerce, like a brand. You know, if you're doing a Verizon commercial, you don't want to put yellow in it. Of course. And so I understand that. Um, you know, but I love working with people that are that. If you remind me of me, I, I have a feeling. I, the one thing I will say that's for some, with some of the directors that that may have that I that I may have quote unquote been up their ass on shit and, or whatever, or just mm-hmm. been difficult to work with. Usually at the end, um, there's all love. You know, there's always love because you go, "Wow, we made something good." Yeah, yeah. And, in, and and it's not because I made it good. It's because no. we, I didn't. I did. I wasn't a. I wasn't a passenger. Right. I never um, thought about it that way, actually, as a creative. I never thought about the director 
approaching this creative creatively thinking that there's a way we can actually maybe make this better and the creative team's going to contribute in the moment to actually push this thing i, I think that i think that the the, the dynamic has always been, in my experience as a creative, that the director is just executing our vision. We're making sure that it's, that's, that it, it holds up to where what we wanted. But no, it's way more. It can be way more than that, and you can change things within 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 a space. Within a space. Yeah. I mean, you can't I, you can't redefine the idea. On you can't the redefine the idea. Not always. I mean, it's it's hard. It's hard. To, even if you want to, I have a lot. I think one one advantage I have is is um, or at least. The one thing I do understand is that I've been in their shoes mm-hmm. and I know that I know how hard it is. Like a lot of times you're sitting with this thing for six months and you've rewritten it and rewritten it and you've been, you've argued and you've done everything. And the fact that you've got what you've got, the board that made its way to us that I was lucky enough to be able to, to write a treatment on that you've, you've miraculously decided to award to me that I get to make this, to change that, uh, to, to, to change that with, with the intention only to serve my own purpose, first of all, is irresponsible. But if you can change it in certain, in any certain way that actually allows for the idea to resemble something, uh, or at least remain close to the integrity of what it was at its core and improve upon it and, and, uh, and get, and at least present that to them in a way that motivates them to talk to their client. That's that to me is like, okay, I didn't burn down your house and build a different one in a different style. Um, I kept your house. I changed the windows. And Mm -hmm. um, I think these windows work better. If you can do that, then I think you can at least improve upon. And it's not my job. It's not my job to change. You know, I think some guys can get away with that. Um, That's a good analogy. Yeah. So what is it about you? What personal trait of yours do you think has served you best so far in your career? What is it about you? Well, that's a great question. Um, what is it about me that is certain? What trait it is about me that has served me best? I think it's, I think it's just uh, aligning myself or or at least look searching for i'm always searching for an ounce of truth in everything i do mm. and i, I think awesome. it's it's looking for truth and humanity in everything i do did i say that i said that at the beginning didn't i you mentioned something about my work having um humanity and you're not the first person that has said that and i uh and i never actually intentionally ever set to say like oh i'm gonna my work is gonna have truth and humanity in it but it's true i always look for I was describing like when I'm casting somebody, right? I'm not going to cast the best looking guy uh, for. I'm not going to cast the best looking, most popular guy because the the fact is the the broad audience that is watching whatever it is I'm making is not the best looking, most popular guy. You know what I think it is too? It's like the work. I know I'm watching a commercial, but I don't feel like I'm watching like a commercial. Like, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's an honesty and a purity to it. And, and even, even the, uh, the Ikea catalog stuff where it's clearly funny, it just doesn't, and it's clearly they're acting. It just doesn't feel like that. There's something well, about it that just feels. That's, that's a great example because those people were all, I mean, it's very rare that you're given the opportunity to cast actors to play actors, people who are mm-hmm. trying to act, right. who are being interviewed, not in character as like when they, when they're actually, those people, when they were in character were being shot as stills mm-hmm. and then um, technically, right. but what the, that was just a documentary about the making of a catalog. So they were so just funny. actually talking about their lives and they truly believed that because this thing gets 25 million prints or whatever it prints printed 25 million there's 25 million books that they're, printed, famous. that they're going to be famous. And and we found different um, levels of that. We found yeah. the, we found the guy who really truly believed that this was his big break. You found the, the hot model yeah. who just is like, yeah, so what, this is kind of my life. I'm kind of like this. And there were different, there's different varying, I guess they were all, they were all delusional, but they were, there was, <laughs> they were all on, on a different, they were all on a spectrum. Yeah. 
And um, that piece won awards for casting. It won casting awards, yeah, yeah which was really cool because yeah. that was kind of the first time I'd won an award strictly on the craft of directing. Yeah, that's awesome. And that was cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. So um, knowing what you know now, I might have asked you this the first time, but knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time and whisper something in young Amir's ear starting out the career, is there anything you wish you had known? Well, how young am I? Let's just say graduating from the circus, starting about to go to BBH. Oh, there's just something I wish I would have known. I mean, is that about life in general? Sure. I would say stop aud auditioning for the people who don't matter. Hmm. Interesting. What do you mean? I mean, learn who your friends are oh. and be friends with the people who actually give you reciprocate love and 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 humility mm. and attention and friendship cool. and don't chase the people who don't very cool well, i hope we're friends absolutely it's a great conversation absolutely thank you for doing this oh it's a pleasure i, I love coming back to be able to do two of these and i wonder what what 10 years ago amir sounded like yeah i wonder too i haven't compared gone back and to this to uh, I know that that was back when I was trying to name the episodes. Rather, than you are, by the way, I gotta say, you are, uh, you're very good at this. Mm -hmm. Having being a guy who is actually, I've, I've tried, I tried to create a, a, a podcast, and uh, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. And you're also like ten years ahead of your time. I know, right? You are ten years, years ahead. Eleven of, years ago, no one knew what this was. No one knew what this was. This and, is the longest running advertising podcast on the in the world, like by far. Is it really? Yeah, eleven. No one was run, No one made advertising podcasts and still does. That started eleven years ago. Yeah, I mean it's it's great. And how many? What is this? Two two hundred and three hundred? Have you done? I, close to three hundred. I don't know the number. Two eighty something. Thank you for thank you for listening, listeners. And Amir, thank you for doing this with me. Hey, listeners, if you want to get a hold of Amir Farhang, you can do so. Amirfarhang dot com is where you should start. Um, you can also meet reach him at Amir at hungryman dot com or Amir zero at gmail.com. Again, I remind you that is the free Google Mail service. You can reach me as always at Dan's Podcast at Mac.com. Please like the Facebook page. It's not for my ego, it's for you. It's uh, Facebook.com slash DGMS Podcast and uh, Balserville.com. I'll remind you also um, if you're on your uh, smartphone, just type in Balserville.com and listen to every episode right there in your, uh, in your, in your mobile browser. Um, and I'll be back in two weeks. Um, Amir, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And uh, you want entertainment now and you're sitting in front of a screen, go check out Amir's work. Until then, I'll see you in two weeks, listeners. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>